can't feel at home in this world anymore. If that don't fire you up, <laughs> your wood's wet, folks. I'm telling you, that fire person up. Because that's what we're waiting for. A day when we lay these tents down and put on the new body. That day's coming. But until then, we keep moving forward, don't we? Because the alternative is not to move forward, and that's not what pleases the Lord. This morning, moments like this stand out. If I were to put an attribute on today, or maybe one word, uh, for me, I guess the word would be thankfulness. I'm very thankful today to be here to begin to serve at Elkton Baptist Church. But to be honest, it's easy to be thankful in a setting like this. This is one of those events. Well, I've been, uh, I've been, it's a positive event. And an occasion that I've been looking forward to for a little while, but one that you all have had a vision for for about a year as you have been seeking your next shepherd. But not every event that we experience is, um, well, would fall in that category of being fun, enjoyable, uh, easy to give thanks for. Not everything we go to is easy to be thankful for. But nonetheless, thankfulness or being thankful, folks, that is a right fine virtue. Would you agree? When it comes to thankfulness, we admire it when we see it, don't we? We appreciate it when we are the recipient of thankfulness. We know it's the right thing to do because we've been told from here up to be a thankful person. And we notice it when it's missing, don't we? In fact, um, it can be conspicuously absent when its opposite shows up, a lack of gratitude. I used to work with a guy years ago when I worked underground. Uh, bless his ever-loving heart. You give that guy a suitcase of $50 bills, he'd complain they were at hundreds. I mean, he would find something to complain about. He'd have to hunt for it. And folks, he was a pretty good hunter. It was easy for him to complain. But this morning, I want to look at thankfulness from Scripture. Giving thanks or being thankful or, or actually saying thanks. And I'd like you to notice with me as we move through Scripture this morning that the exhortations we're going to see to those who were the original recipients of the letters in the New Testament, those are also given to God's own today. Because you see, this is not just a, this is not just a history book. While there's a lot of history here, this is applicable to today as if the ink was still wet on the page, which would include the virtue of thankfulness. They're given to you and I who are twice born because thankfulness benefits the Christian in his walk, in his witness, and his work or service for Christ. Let's bow for a word of prayer and we will dig into Scripture. Father, thank you again for this day. You have blessed us with this Lord's Day of new beginnings here. We trust you with the morning. Thank you for your word that is timeless, that applies to us even today. Give us ears to hear what your Spirit says in Jesus' name. Amen. The benefits of being thankful or being grateful. It won't be my habit. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I don't always move around when I preach. Timmy promises he can chase me wherever I go if I move around. And I won't test him this morning because I don't have the portable mic. 
But let me just say this. This morning we're going to move through just a handful of verses. So we'll be moving around the New Testament at a reasonably quick rate. Uh, it's not generally my habit to do that. Generally what I like to do is I pick a text and stay there. But the topic of thankfulness has been leaning on me for about two weeks now. So I just wanted to hit a topical sermon this morning. The first benefit, if you will, of thankfulness. Did you know that being thankful can keep you from God's wrath? You say, how is that? I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. Open to Romans chapter 1 to start with this morning. Romans chapter 1. Now, Romans 1 is often a text used, if you will, to cite uh, God's disapproval for a particular lifestyle. But if we're fair with the text, it's more than that. This text is really a text about suppressing the truth and the consequences of doing that very thing. And the consequences can be quite devastating. Romans chapter 1, we'll start reading in verse 18, and we'll just move down through about verse 25, okay? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Folks, the wrath of God comes upon those in this text because something has been made very clear to them. And they have made a choice to step away from that and as a result, it says, verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. Therefore, that is why the wrath of God is revealed to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. It seems to me that these things for which God's wrath is poured out uh, is so evident to man that one has to be taught to turn from him because there's so much natural evidence that we're all, that none of us has an excuse. To deny God. You know, you've heard this phrase, atheist. You know, everybody's, everybody knows an atheist. I suggest to you there's really no such thing as an atheist. Because you have to have been everywhere, and you have to know all things to know there is no God. And since none of us has the ability to do that, I think perhaps the best description might be somebody who is agnostic. Who simply is convinced you probably can't know for sure. But atheists, I understand the label. I understand in part where they're coming from. But technically, it's kind of impossible to be one. Because you kind of have to be God to be one. Which becomes a self-defeating argument. It chases right back down, doesn't it? Uh, picking up verse 20. To, excuse me, 21. Even though they knew God, so there's the evidence, even though they did, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks. Those three words are often glanced over quickly when it comes time to jump through this text. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. And here's what happens when you don't honor God for who he is or thank him or be a thankful person. Look what happens. They became foolish in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. They professed to be wise, 
but they become fools and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, because of all the evidence that is brought to man, that he has no excuse to turn his back from, for those who do turn away from the obvious truths, verse 24, God gave them over to the lusts of their heart so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, which is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1 does seem to make it pretty clear that one of the benefits of being thankful can actually spare you from God's wrath, particularly when you look at verse 21. Thank you. Verse 21. Thank you, Lord. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Folks, thankfulness can keep you out of God's wrath. Do you believe that? Folks, I believe that. I really do. We might think it to be a very simple attribute of being thankful. But it's pretty powerful from God's perspective. Thankfulness can keep us from God's wrath. Another benefit of thankfulness is this. Thankfulness can keep you in God's will. Turn to 1 Thessalonians in your New Testament. And uh, if you're not a habit of being there, it's right before 2 Thessalonians, if that helps. And just a little uh, helpful guide as you move through your New Testament. There are five New Testament books that begin with T. They are all back to back to back to back to back. And they're alphabetical. So if you're looking for one and you found one that starts with T and it's not the one, you're not very far away. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Many a well-meaning Christian desires to know God's will for their life. If you're born again in this room, have you ever asked God, what is your, what is your will, God? Anybody? Well, I think we all have. We want to know, what is God's will for me? We want to know that. And as I read a few verses from 1 Thessalonians 5, see if you can spot God's will from this text. Now, not all of God's will is, the specifics is not always on, scripture, on the pages of Scripture, but sometimes it is. And those are the ones we really want to embrace when we find those. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let me pick it up in verse 14. We urge you, brethren, Paul writes, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. It's a beautiful text, isn't it? This is one of those texts when a young man goes to Bible college. It's one of the easiest texts to outline for a sermon because it is it jumps off the page at you. Each attribute just right there. Easy to find and communicate. But verse 18 says, In everything give thanks. Why? 
because this is God's will for you who are in Christ to be a thankful person. If you're born again and you've ever wondered what is God's will for you, you can have 100% confidence that when you are living thankfully, expressing thanks, grateful to God for what he has done for you, 100% confidence you are swimming neck deep in God's will when you do that. And when you do that, you can even be thankful for things that aren't necessarily easy to be thankful for. Does the name Corey Ten Boom ring a bell? I see a couple of heads, indeed. She and her sister and her extended, her, her father, uh, were, they tried to hide the Jews during the Holocaust. She and her sister, Betsy, were in the same concentration camp at Ravensbrück. And as spiritually powerful as Corrie Ten Boom was, she was at first to tell you that her sister was really the spiritual giant, Betsy. They were in the same dorm, as a very kind way to put it, as they were in the concentration camp. And Betsy would try to encourage the women there, including her sister Corrie Ten Boom, to be thankful for all things, in all things. And Corey said to her sister, I understand, Betsy, I will, but I won't be thankful for the fleas. <laughs> Their dorm was infested with fleas. Betsy said, be thankful for them. She said, I can't do that. Well, they both learned later on that because of the fleas, the guards would never come in to inspect. And Betsy and Corey Ten Boom were able to lead many women to faith in Christ behind that door that nobody would walk through because of the fleas. I've never been one to say I'm thankful for the fleas. But we don't know everything, do we? From God's perspective, we just don't know the whole story. Being thankful keeps you from God's wrath. Being thankful keeps you in God's will. Next, turn to Colossians chapter 3. Just hang a left a couple pages. Colossians chapter 3. And notice with me in Colossians 3 that being thankful also keeps you at peace. Being thankful keeps you at peace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And be thankful. If we allow peace and contentment, and by the way, this isn't necessarily commanded, because it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. You know what that means? Please choose to do so. That's God's way of telling his followers, let this happen in your life. You let this take over. Let the peace of God. If we allow that peace or contentment, maybe another good word for peace, to rule, to have authority, or maybe to say, to just anchor us, You'll find it's easier and perhaps even enjoyable to be thankful. And thankfulness will fuel your peace. Like the two brothers who were, uh, they were brought up in a small town. One brother moved off to the city when he got older and got full of himself. And there he was in the city and got successful and country brother invited city brother back to the house one time to spend a weekend and so city brother came on out and country brother was preparing a meal and they sat down there to a meager meal and country brother bowed his head to thank the Lord for the food and the city brother a little uncomfortable with that habit that he learned from youth but abandoned it when he went to the city but he kind of 
kept his eye open and bowed his head in obligation, if you will. And the brother thanked the Lord for the meal. They enjoyed the meal and afterwards cleaned up and they went to the front porch, a couple of chairs, and just kind of kicking it back a little bit. Well, city brother says to country brother, you know, I noticed you still are in the habit of thanking the Lord for the food. He says to country brother, you know we'd had that food whether you thanked or not, don't you? I mean, you know that's true, right? Well, country brother sitting in his rocking chair, spinning a toothpick between his teeth, he says, yeah, I know that. That food had been on the table whether I thanked the Lord or not. Rocked a couple times, spun that toothpick, and he said, but it sure tastes better when I do. You find that to be true? I find that to be true. Indeed. Verse 15 of Colossians 3. Being thankful keeps you at peace. The peace of Christ rules in our heart in verse 15. Then all of a sudden something happens that we find in verse 16. The word of Christ, when richly dwelling in you, produces a thankfulness that does this. Keeps you singing. So we've looked at verse 15. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. If you notice in this verse, sometimes thankfulness is the byproduct or maybe even the result of another activity. Here, wisdom, instruction, admonition one to another gives over to a song in their heart to God. And that's the result of letting the word dwell in you richly. And how many of you know that the only way for the word of God to dwell in you richly is for you to dwell in the Word of God richly. As the old saying goes, you get in it, it gets in you. And you probably heard it that, uh, see, this book will keep you from sin. Or sin will keep you from this book. And notice, if you will, back in verse 15, that the peace that is to rule in your heart, it's not just to rule in my heart, it's also to infect or affect the entire body of Christ. Let me reread 15 and point that out. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, the body of believers, to which you are thankful and allowing that peace uh, is to be spilled out onto them. And then verse 16, if you'll notice, the wisdom, the instruction, and the admonition received by the Christian is for one another. Also to impact the entire body of Christ. Verse 16, rereading it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. So others are to be impacted, which takes us to verse 17. Verse 17 reads like this. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through God, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. Thankfulness keeps you serving well. It gives you God's perspective in the everydayness that is most days, isn't it? Whatever the Christian does, he's to give thanks to the Father through Jesus Christ, and notice that it includes everything I say and everything I do. Verse 17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, whatever I do, whether I say it, whether I do it, give thanks to God for it. 
You know, when you spend a little time in the New Testament, uh, you begin to see just how vital the virtue of thankfulness is in the Christian's walk. It's pretty big. Thankfulness keeps you from God's wrath. Thankfulness keeps you in God's will. Thankfulness keeps you at peace. Thankfulness keeps you singing. Thankfulness keeps you serving well. Isn't there a hymn, help me out here, in my heart there rings a melody. Indeed, rings a melody. It's a song that means a lot to my wife and I for a lot of reasons, and I'm sure you'll find out one day. All right, how about this one? Turn to the book of Philippians, if you will. Hang a left, just a page or two. Thankfulness also keeps you protected. Thankfulness keeps you protected. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You may be familiar. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Now, some of these texts, you'll notice, they got a measure of overlap, if you will. But notice in this text how prayer and thanksgiving are so deeply intertwined. Prayer and thankfulness says they stay off, they keep back anxiousness. Now, there's times when we, we will equate the word anxiousness with the word worry. I've always struggled to find a good balance there because I don't want anybody telling me not to worry about my kids if they're sick. Guess what? I'm fixing to worry about my kids because I love my kids. But I would say this. I suggest to you this word, the Greek for anxiousness, is not just another word for worry, although we could use it that way. But this means picking up something that only God should carry. It really is a self-absorbed attitude that's wholly removed from God and only focused on me. It's pretty irrational. As Adrian Rogers once said to a woman who came up to him after he preached on worrying, she says, he was standing at the back as folks filed by, she shook his hand and she looked him in the eye and said, don't you dare tell me to not worry. Everything I worry about doesn't happen. It works, she said. Well, it doesn't. It caused her to be anxious, picking up things she should not pick up. But if we've learned that bad habit of picking up things that only God should carry, folks, I suggest to you, if it's been learned, it can be unlearned. It really, truly can be unlearned. And instead of being self-focused, we would be God-focused in everything with thanksgiving. Telling him these things versus take to myself these things I have no business seeking to handle or pick up or carry. Notice what happens when you are a thankful, praying person. The tail end of the verse says, uh, verse 7, the peace of God which passes all understanding, all comprehension, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Guard your heart. Guard your mind. It protects you. protects your heart. That's what you feel. And it protects your mind what you think. Folks, the praying thankful Christian has something that cannot, that defies description because the verse says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will do two things. Guard how you think, how you feel and how you think both areas. He'll protect all of that. Protects every single thing about you. Now, there's much more that could be said about thankfulness that one sermon 
will not cover. But I don't want to miss talking about how thankfulness also keeps you humble. And I'm just going to move through the first chapter of seven different New Testament books. And I'll just read them quickly, and you'll pick them up as I hit them. Romans chapter 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. The book of Philippians. Chapter 1. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Colossians chapter 1. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. And in the small little book of Philemon, small one chapter book, Paul says, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. Thanks, 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 thanks for others. Did you see it? So why call this humble? I call this humble because these texts are the Apostle Paul thanking God for one another. For the good fortune of other people, even when you find it difficult to enjoy or even be thankful for some things, and it comes, you know, it's one thing to struggle with learning to be thankful. It's one thing to stay there. We all get there. But here's what maturity does. It gets you out of that funk a little quicker. That's what will happen. Expressing thanks for another's gain moves your attention, it diverts it from you towards someone else. A case of inward eyeballs, if you will, is pretty unflattering because all it can see is self. And when all we can see is ourself, in and of ourselves, we're not much without Christ, right? But a humble spirit focused on others takes away the blues a little bit. Would you agree? Now, you've heard the phrase, a joy shared doubles a joy. But never forget the other half of that statement. A grief shared cuts it in half. Somebody once came up with three ways to fail at everything in life. And those three things are complain about everything, blame others for your problems, and never be grateful. We all have a choice. We have a choice to be either grumbly hateful or humbly grateful. And we've all got that choice. What will you choose? The Apostle Paul uh, certainly had a lot to grumble about if he chose to grumble. And opportunities to shift blame, and he had those opportunities. In fact, a couple of times he did mention those who were his tormentors. And he said, I'm going to let the Lord deal with them because I can't deal with them. I've got to let the Lord deal with them. But like me and you, Paul chose thankfulness to live what he preached. 
And let me, in closing, read to you a very intimate text about Paul's position of who he was in Christ and how thankful he was for that. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he writes this. I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. This is Paul. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, among whom I am chief. I am sinner number one. I'm the worst sinner I know, Paul says. Yet, verse 16, for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as a foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And then he says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Can you thank God for the moment when he saved you from your sin? You can. We should but you can't if you haven't been saved. Because one must realize they aren't saved from their sin in process, if you will. A person is saved from their sin in a moment. In that moment, when they believe the truth that they're a sinner who cannot remedy that problem in and of their own efforts. You know, if a person could scrub up their life enough to be acceptable to God and be saved, you know what? That makes Jesus the biggest sucker there ever was. Because he didn't have to die for that person if he could be good enough. Folks, none of us can be good enough. We must believe that our efforts are as filthy rags. And one is saved in a moment when he believes the truth that Jesus' death on the cross has satisfied God's wrath toward my sin. And then finally, one must believe the truth that when you transfer your trust from wherever it might be, some trusting in baptism, some are trusting in goodness, some are trusting in faithful churchmanship, nothing wrong with any of those things, but those things won't get anybody to heaven. When a person recognizes they need to transfer their trust only to what took place on a cross 2,000 years ago, turning from everything else, it is at that moment God makes you his child. Period. Are you born again? Nicodemus thought he was born again until he met up with Jesus in the cover of night one time and Jesus said, well, you're going to have to be born again, Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus realized he was, ultimately realized he was a sinner who needed saved, not a sinner who needed to scrub up his behavior. I thought I was right with God until I recognized one particular Sunday that my religious activity and all my efforts weren't enough. In fact, it's not a matter of it's not a matter of being enough. They're no good. Just a whole bigger pile of no good. Because I need to turn from my efforts. If I believe my efforts, whatever that might be, will make me right with God. I need to turn from that and turn only to what happened on the cross to be forgiven of my sin. If you're not sure that's you, why not today? Two weeks removed from Resurrection Sunday. Place your trust in Christ as Savior. If you'd like to do that, 
or want the assurance of whether you are or not, I would love to talk to you about that. And you have a room of three deacons that would also be glad to talk to you about how you can know for sure you'll spend eternity in heaven with God. And if you are born again, a great way to avoid digressing in your faith is to be thankful. To be a thankful person. Thankful to God for what he has done for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your light being the light to all men. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who for the joy before him has indeed endured the cross, has despised the shame, seated at your right hand, at your throne in heaven, the throne of majesty, interceding for those of us who by faith have come to you to be forgiven. Thank you for the opportunities to say thanks to you. Thank you for saving my soul, Father, 25 years ago. And thank you for the opportunity to be considered worthy of being put into ministry, especially today here at Elkton Baptist. Father, thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.